It's a pleasure always to be on this campus and to feel that spirit which comes from the other side of the pulpit. You all look great. But I didn't bring my running shoes, and I noticed that that's something that some of you feel you need to get around the campus, and get to all the activities you want to get to. But I'm told when you have your running shoes on, it's good to get out of your way. <laughs> I'm pleased to be here and help all of you memorialize the great leader whose birth we celebrate 200 years ago. Much has been written and said about Brigham Young and his great leadership and accomplishments. There is little that has not been thoroughly poured over, analyzed, and commented upon. In order to present some history about this great leader, which is not so well known, I ask Ron Esplin for his able assistance, and I am indebted to him for much of the material I'm using. One evening in early 1859, after the peaceful conclusion of the Utah War, a keen test of leadership of Brigham Young was being analyzed. A group of men in Brigham Young's office were talking about the game of chess. Brez Young remarked that he knew nothing of such games. But then he added, I have had to play with the kingdoms of the world, with living characters. And when some observed that he had played a great game, he, said, he replied, Yes, and I am not displeased with nor regret any move that I have made. I have chosen to focus on what appears to me to be the source of his absolute self-confidence and the complete certainty he had in his own judgment. I know of no other explanation for his boldness and audacity in thinking of moving a whole people more than 60,000 by wagon and handcart across much of the North America wilderness to the Great Basin. As President Hinckley said, no plow had ever broken its soil. He knew nothing of its fertility, nothing of the seasons, the weather, the frost, the severity of the winters, the possibility of insect plagues. Jim Bridger and Miles Goodyear had nothing good to say concerning this place. Sam Brannan pleaded with him to go on to California. He listened to none of them. He led his people in this hot and what must have appeared as a very forlorn place. When he arrived, he looked across this broad expanse to the Salt Lake in the west and said, this is the right place, close quote. Brigham Young was either present or had heard with Wilford Woodruff and others the prophet Joseph say, brethren, I have been very much edified and instructed in your testimonies here tonight. But I want to say to you before the Lord that you know nothing more of the destinies of this church and kingdom than a babe upon its mother's lap. You don't comprehend it. It is only a little handful of priesthood you see here tonight. but. This church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. It will fill the Rocky Mountains. 
There will be tens of thousands of Latter-day Saints who will gather in the Rocky Mountains. This people will go into the Rocky Mountains. They will there build temples to the Most High." Close quote. How could he have been so sure when he told Wilford Woodruff upon entering this valley, this is the right place, drive on. The answer is that as the Valley of the Salt Lake came into view, Brigham Young was seeing much more than the salt flats and the swarms of black crickets. Sometime later, Wilford Woodruff described their interest into the valley in these words. When we came out of the canyon into the full view of the valley, I turned the side of my carriage around, open to the west, and President Young rose from his bed and took a survey of the country. While gazing upon the scene before us, he was enwrapped in a vision for several minutes. He had seen the valley before in vision, and upon this occasion he saw the future glory of Zion and of Israel as they would be planted in the valleys of these mountains. When the vision had passed, he said, it is enough, this is the right place. Drive on, close quote. I believe this is why he summarily ignored the comments of Jim Bridger, Miles Goodyear, and Sam Brannan. Apparently, Brigham Young dismissed Sam Brannan's entreaties to take the saints on to California without even a second thought. His certainty that the valley of the Great Salt Lake and the Great Basin was the right place rested upon the higher intelligence which he received in the vision before they started. Brigham Young has been recognized by many for his leadership ability. Even critics and non-members regard him as a great colonizer. Characterized by some as a practical sage, yet he was also a man of great faith. And I believe that it was his profound faith that was at the very heart of his success as a leader. With this profound faith came a sense of confidence, not only in the rise of the church and the growth of the kingdom, but also in his own role as prophet and leader. Having been a keen observer of the prophet Joseph Smith and many of the events of the Restoration, Brigham bore strong witness that the leadership keys had been left with the Twelve after the prophet was martyred. Indeed, the Lord had, quote, commanded him to endow the Twelve with these keys and priesthood. In the dark days following the martyrdom, he reminded the saints, you cannot appoint a prophet, but if you will let the twelve remain and act in their place, the keys of the kingdom are with them, and they can manage the affairs of the church and direct all things aright. He also told the saints that if they would not sustain the twelve, they, the twelve, would raise up a people who would. That showed how much confidence he had in the twelve, for he knew that they held the keys, the commission, and the responsibility to build on the foundation Joseph had laid. Brigham and the apostles all knew the importance of completing the Davu Temple. And with their example and enthusiasm, construction work accelerated. The fire of their enthusiasm brought rapid progress and feelings of great joy in seeing their goal coming to pass. However, as their enemies saw the walls go up, they felt threatened and vowed to drive them out before their beloved temple could be finished. 
In the midst of this angry furor, Brigham Young inquired of the Lord whether they should stay and finish the temple. He recorded in his diary, the answer was, we should. He remained calm. Quote, I am composed, he told the Nauvoo Legion before some of them took the field. Nor has the late disturbance had any effect upon me, close quote. Clearly, Brigham Young was sustained by inner strength and spiritual gifts. A man such as Joseph Smith once described, who enjoyed a personal promise from God as an anchor to the soul, sure and steadfast, though the thunders might roll and the lightnings flash and earthquakes bellow and war gather thick around, yet this hope and knowledge would support the soul in every hour of trial and tribulation." Close quote. The construction continued despite the threats of the mob and rooms of the temple were dedicated as they were completed. As the saints began to receive their temple blessings, Brigham Young promised that those being endowed, that if they will be as diligent in prayer as a few have been, that is, the twelve and others endowed before the completion of the temple, I promise you in the name of Israel's God that we shall accomplish the will of God and go out in due time from the Gentiles with power and plenty, and no power shall stay us." Close quote. History shows that the saints surely did go out from the presence of their enemies and found the place which God had prepared for them. As the leader across the American wilderness, Brigham Young believed so strongly that this journey to the West was the Lord's errand. Therefore, they could not fail. But being the practical sage that he was, he knew that success had a price. It could only come with diligence, sacrifice, and hardship. And he understood that even with their best efforts, they could not do it alone. They would need God's help. But his great faith and sense of purpose brought him both confidence and peace during the winter and spring of 1847 as they prepared for the long trek west. Part of Brigham Young's unwavering confidence came because he knew the plan was not his own. As he told the saints nearly 10 years later after their arrival in the valley, I did not devise the great scheme of the Lord's in coming the way to send this people to these mountains. Who did? It was the power of God that wrought out salvation for this people, he insisted. I never could have devised such a plan, close quote. Further tests of President Young's faith were still in store. The severest one came during 1857 and 1858 as thousands of United States troops, one third of the standing army of the United States marched in Utah, escorting Alfred Cumming, who was to be sent to replace Brigham Young as governor. President Young knew only too well from their experience in Missouri what enemies can do when backed by military authority. Yet he was confident that if the saints did all in their power, the Lord would help them. President Young declared martial law and mobilized the territorial militia to do everything short of bloodshed to slow down the advancing troops. Grasslands and supply wagons were burned, provisions and cattle confiscated, and the advancing units harassed day and night. Still, they kept coming, ever nearer until winter struck in their favor as the timely arrival of heavy snow stopped the army in its tracks, forcing it into winter camp 
80 miles from the Mormon settlement, Brigham Young recognized that his leadership was not flawless. Quote, there are weaknesses manifested in man that I am bound to forgive. He said on one occasion, I am right there myself. I am liable to make mistakes, close quote. He continued, and just as set in his feelings as any man alive, but he said, I am where I can see the light. I try to keep in the light. The assurance that he felt was not that he would make no mistakes or always know what was best, but that in the end, God oversees the essential. He quickly abandoned what did not work well for something that might work better. But his ultimate direction and destination remained unchanged. Long-term goals based on revelation provided a balanced consistency in his day-to-day -day decisions and gave him the confidence to press forward regardless of the obstacles or even the errors. Sometimes his bold and powerful leadership was disconcerting. For example, after his dangerous winter journey to the Salt Lake Valley to mediate peace with the Army, Colonel Kane was at first offended when Brigham Young rejected his counsel. However, when Kane finally agreed to do whatever President Young told him to do, this is what Brigham Young said of the incident. I told him as he had been inspired to come here, he should go to the army and do as the Spirit led him, to do all and all that would be right, and he did so and all was right. He thought it very strange because we were not afraid of the army. I told him we were not afraid of all the world if they made war upon us, the Lord was able to deliver us out of their hands and would do it if we did right." Close quote. Few months after the peaceful resolution of the Utah War, President Young walked past the temple grounds to the Staines Mansion, which is now called the Devereux House, to visit Governor Cumming. Concerned that they had narrowly averted a disaster, the fair-minded governor cautioned Brigham Young to refrain from provocative or rash acts in the future. Quote, with all due respect to your excellency, the president interrupted, I do not calculate to take the advice of any man that lives in relationship to my affairs. Although he recognized that he had friends and counselors to advise him during such crisis, he made it plain that in God alone would he trust. My religion is true, he told the governor solemnly, and I am determined to obey its precept while I live. He would, he insisted, follow the counsels of my heavenly Father, and I have the faith to follow it and risk the consequences. You may think this is very strange, he concluded, but you will yet see that I am right." Close quote. Understanding Brigham Young's religious conviction and the religious context within which the Latter-day Saints responded to him, it is essential to an understanding of his leadership. As one visitor to his office recorded and others noted, Brigham Young had an amazing self-confidence and absolute certainty in, of himself and his opinions. This certainly, certainly stemmed from his conviction that he was doing God's work. He believed that if he and other mortals did all they could to establish the kingdom, God would see to the rest. This makes understandable his firmness and calm, unshakable optimism in the face of seemingly impossible circumstances. The skeptical but perceptive Jules Remy recognized that Brigham Young 
being clearly convinced of the truth of his religion, he embraced, said, has set before him as the object of his existence the extension and triumph of his doctrine. And this end he pursues with a tenacity that nothing can shake, and with that stubborn persistence and ardent ambitious which makes great priests and great statesmen." Close quote. The leadership of the eminent politician and able administrator was at root religious, and he and his companion were forced to conclude that they lived imperfectly convinced of the sincerity of his faith. Brigham was a firm believer in faith and works. He told his colleagues in 1870 that he knew from the start that if the saints did their part, the Lord would do the rest. For Brigham Young showed his faith by expending every energy and resource and on good works before turning to God for assistance. That was part of the program, and I emphasize is still part of the program. What God expected and what was necessary if man was developed. Don't ask God to protect you from the Indians if you're unwilling to build forts, he counseled. Man is left alone, he taught, to practice him to depend on his own resources and try his independency. Folklore has preserved this attitude in the story of President Young overlooking the valley with an admiring minister. What you and the Lord have done with this place is truly amazing, observed the visitor, to which President Young replied, Yes, Reverend, but you should have seen it when the Lord had it alone. <laughs> Man was to use all his skills and effort and energy for the kingdom, and if that were not enough, then he might ask for God's intervention. Though proud of his down-to-earth and formidable talents, Brigham Young did credit God for the gift of them. I know how I received the knowledge that I have got, he said in 1866, recalling his early years with Joseph. I had but one prayer, and I offered it all of the time. And that was that I might be permitted to hear Joseph speak on doctrine and see his mind reach out untrammeled to the grasp of the deep things of God. He maintained that an angel never watched him closer and that he would constantly watch him and, if possible, learn doctrine and principle beyond that which he expressed. It required several years of this close attention to the prophet, he declared with some exaggeration, before I pretended to open my mouth to speak at all. Brigham Young took care to never let an opportunity pass without getting with the prophet Joseph and of hearing him speak in public and private so that I might draw understanding from the fountain from which he spoke. This, he insisted, is the secret of the success of your humble servant. President Hunter told me of a time many years ago when he heard of an elderly man who had worked on the Salt Lake Temple as an engineer when he was young on his way to California. This engineer was not a member of the church and was for a time in Salt Lake City before going on to his destination in California. The engineer recalled seeking an appointment with President Brigham Young. In those days, visitors sat on a bench and moved along the bench as they waited for an appointment with the president. He wanted counsel from the president regarding a construction problem on the temple. Brigham Young had made furniture and did carpentry, so he knew a few practical things about construction. 
And so he had an eye for things of that kind. But he had never constructed a building like the temple. On this occasion, he looked at the plan for part of the Salt Lake Temple that this engineer had brought. He drew a line in the shape of an arc and said, this is the way to construct it. As I remember it, the engineer never joined the church, but testified, you can't tell me Brigham Young was not a prophet. In the early days of the church, many fell away because they would not sustain Joseph Smith as the Lord's anointed. In fact, the prophet Joseph Smith said of the leaders in Kirtland, quote, there have been but two but what have lifted their heel against me, namely Brigham Young and Heber C. Kimball. Because of their faithful loyalty, the Lord called Brigham Young to lead the church west. And when the first residency was reorganized, Heber C. Kimball was called as his first counselor to Brigham Young. Brigham Young died with the name of Joseph upon his lips. He spoke of him in and his works in these words. I honor and revere the name of Joseph Smith. I delight to hear it. I love it. I love his doctrine. I feel like shouting hallelujah all of the time when I think that I ever knew Joseph Smith, the prophet whom the Lord raised up and ordained. I am bold to say that Jesus Christ accepted no better man ever lived or does live upon this earth. I am his witness. In the marvelous experience of Brigham Young in February of 1847, when the prophet Joseph appeared to him in a dream or vision, Brigham pleaded to be reunited with the prophet. Brigham Young asked the prophet if he had any message for the brethren. The prophet said, tell the people to be humble and faithful and to keep sure that they have the Spirit of the Lord and it will lead them right. Be careful and not turn away from the still, small voice. It will teach you what to do and where to go. It will yield the fruits of the kingdom. Tell the brethren to keep their hearts open to conviction so that when the Holy Ghost comes to them, their hearts will be ready to receive it. The prophet further directed Brigham Young as follows. They can tell the Spirit of the Lord from all other spirits. It will whisper peace and joy to their souls. It will take malice hatred, strife, and all evil from their hearts, and their whole desire will to do good and bring forth righteousness and build up the kingdom of God. I add my witness to the great prophetic leadership of Brigham Young and testify that that prophetic leadership and the keys of that office have remained in the church and rest upon our great prophet in this day and time, President Gordon B. Hinckley. May we always be found following and leading the counsel and direction of our prophets. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.